Okay, so last, I was going to say last week, last lecture we did, so let's recall, we did these confusing generalized dyadic systems. And we just called these either script D or T script D omega, where T is a dilation parameter and t between one and two is all that matters. And omega is in the infinite product of zero, one to the z, where we think of this as being formal binary expansions of real numbers. And the translations go at every scale in a slightly different way, and it's a little bit odd. And you, you don't really need to know every detail of how these work. Just think these look like the standard dyadic system, but they're just moved and dilated a bit. All of the combinatorics are the same as the standard dyadic system. Everything behaves like dyadic intervals. We just need to maybe have them at different places in space so that we can have the same translation invariance and dilation invariance that the Hilbert transform has. So that we have some hope of actually bounding that operator with these methods. So we define those things and we showed a, a kind of Burkholder type inequality for these. So if X is UMD, of course, P is between one and infinity, of course. The LP norm of F is equivalent to a Rademacher average over all of the intervals in one of these generalized dyadic systems. So here, this script D is some generalized dyadic system, any of them, doesn't matter which. And if you take this Rademacher average over the generalized higher expansion, the HIs are half functions. On, these are standard half functions on intervals. Then we have this equivalence here. So this is like a Burkholder characterization because it's a Rademacher average over what turns out to be a Martingale difference. Although we're on R, so it's not actually a Martingale on a probability space, but we reduced it down to that. And we also had that this Rademacher variable here, we could either index it by all of the intervals or we could index it by all of the scales, all of the lengths of the intervals. And then this just, this gives you a, an equal Rademacher average just by support considerations on the function hi. So you can either randomize over all of the intervals or randomize over all of the lengths so that if you have two intervals with the same length, then they actually get the same random sign, the same Rademacher variable. That's just a really short summary of what happened on Tuesday. And from this, we're gonna bound some operators that turned out to be quite close to the Hilbert transform and then get the Hilbert transform from that. So let's define these new operators. Where should I start with that? Let's just start by defining some certain translations and dilations of functions. For a function K, the scalar valued, on the real line and for an interval i of the real line let's let l of i denote the left endpoint of the interval i so i is a bounded interval i should say so this is the left endpoint we don't need a name for the right endpoint let's let k sub i so this is just in analogy with the half functions. K sub i is the function k, but we translate it by the left end point of the interval. So we're taking k and we're moving it over to i. And then we dilate that according to the length of the interval. So just a good way to think about this. If k is supported on the unit interval, then k sub i is supported on i. This is how we should be thinking about this. Taking a function as localized to just the unit interval is like a model function and then developing a whole function system indexed by all of the intervals given by just translating and dilating this function over to the relevant location and scale in space. And this dilation, just to recall, this is an L2 normalized dilation. So if K has L2 norm one, then K sub I also has L2 norm one for every I. All right.
uh, for the special case where you take h to be the half function on the unit interval, hi is the hi that we defined before. So you take the, the base half function on the unit interval and you translate it and dilate it around like this, you get all the half functions. This is the motivation for this definition in the end, just taking like a, a what you'd call a base wavelet, if you know wavelets, and then getting a whole system of wavelets based on that. So with this definition, we can define the operators we need to consider. So a function, actually, I'm not even defining the operators yet. I'm just defining a particular class of Ks that are relevant to us. A function K, as before, is called an admissible base function. Just to use a term that doesn't get used anywhere else, just for our own convenience. K is an admissible base function if it is a finite linear combination of half functions h sub j such that all of these intervals j are sub intervals of the unit interval and they're standard dyadic intervals. So the, the endpoints uh, have the form two to the minus j for some j, two to the minus j times k for some j and k. So standard dyadic intervals, not shifted ones. Uh, standard dyadic intervals with the same length, two to the minus j for some j in n. And we also need to have that the L infinity norm of K is less than or equal to one. So K is gonna be supported on the unit interval bounded by one. And it's actually just gonna be a finite linear combination of half functions at some fixed smaller scale. So just as a quick example, if this is the unit interval, you can take, I'll write it out first, K to be this particular function is actually going to be important later. That's why I'm using it as an example. Square root of two, half function on the interval zero to one half minus half function on the interval one half to one. What this looks like is, so you've got a half function on the interval from zero to one half and you have the half function on the interval one half to one, but negated. So it looks like this, sorry for the bad drawing one quarter, one half, three quarters. And we normalize it by two to the one half just so that this value here is one. So this is a linear combination of half functions associated with dyadic intervals that are contained in the unit interval. And this is kind of like a discrete cosine on the unit interval. If you think of actual cosine as being like this, right? This is a discrete cosine. And the original half function is like discrete sine, if I've done things right. Yep. And that gives you a bit of clues as to why this relates to the Hilbert transform, if you understand the Hilbert transform already. Otherwise, I'll explain that later on. So this k here would be an admissible base function. Does that make sense? Any issues? No? One more definition. What operators can we build out of admissible base functions? Let D be a generalized dyadic system. It's got some parameters, T and omega, but they don't really matter. X is a Banach space. Uh, K is an admissible base function. I'm gonna call these ABFs just so that I don't have to write admissible base function all the time. Just remember, you know, linear combinations of half functions at the same scale, whatever. K is an admissible base function. And M and N are in the integers with M less than or equal to N. Uh, 
we define an operator. It's called a truncated shift operator. Remember, we're actually looking at truncations of the Hilbert transform where we take the integral from epsilon up to capital epsilon. These truncated shift operators also have a lower scale and an upper scale, and we're, they're going to be related to the truncated Hilbert transforms. Truncated shift operator, which we'll call S sub KMN, or if you want to be really precise, S sub KMN superscript T omega, just to really represent all of the parameters we've got here. There are too many, right? S is associated with a particular generalized dyadic system. So you've got these parameters T and omega. You've got the admissible base function K that it depends on, and you've got some scales M and N. Sorry for all the parameters. It's a bit of a mess, but it has to be done. Here's how you define it. S K M N of F is the sum over all intervals in the generalized dyadic system from scale M to N. I should just define what that is. That's the union of J from M to N of D sub J. So this is all of the intervals with lengths between two to the minus M and two to the minus N. That's right. We take the Haar expansion of F with respect to that dyadic system. So we take these Haar coefficients, but then instead of putting the Haar function here, so this, this would be the Haar expansion of F, that's wrong. We put K sub I instead. That's the real important thing here. So what is this actually doing? Actually, before I say what it's doing, I should make sure that this thing is well-defined because I have a, an infinite sum here because there are infinitely many intervals between scale M and scale N. And I haven't said anything about convergence here. Actually, I should say that here F, <laughs> I should say what F is. F is an x valid function on R, of course. You presume it's like locally integrable so that these Haar coefficients make sense. Locally integrable. Being an LP would be good enough. The reason this is well defined is that for all x in the real line, this sum that defines the operator, so where we put in ki of x and then we multiply by these Haar coefficients, this is a finite sum. So we have this argument from, from Tuesday going by support considerations. This function ki of x is supported on I. So the function K is supported on the unit interval. So this translation dilation K sub I is supported on I. And for every J between M and N, there exists a unique I in D M N such that X is in I. So actually you're only summing over the finitely many scales that are involved. You're not, for every X, you don't need to sum over every single dyadic interval because there's only one at each scale that matters that actually contributes to the sum. So it's a finite sum. So this thing is well-defined as long as the power coefficients are well-defined. Okay, these are the important operators for us, truncated shifts. Just to give a little bit of intuition for what they're doing, If you're given a function f, and if you look at a particular generalized dyadic interval, f has this Haar expansion. So for every one of these intervals, you have these coefficients. And usually what the Haar expansion does is that you take this coefficient and then you multiply it by the associated Haar function. But what this operator does is it takes that coefficient and multiplies it by this admissible base function k translated over to i. And what is K? K is just a linear combination of half functions at potentially smaller scales. A fixed scale, but it could be a lot smaller. So what you might have is some smaller dyadic intervals in the system. And maybe K actually lives on these particular smaller intervals. So you can imagine this interval here is 0, 1. And think of subintervals of 0, 1. This whole picture is translation and dilation invariant. So if you look at what's happening at zero one, the same thing is happening at every interval. So you've got this interval i and k sub i will actually be a linear combination, maybe alpha theta one, alpha theta two, times these half functions here, h i theta one, whatever, some other half functions. 
So this Haar coefficient will be mapped onto the Haar functions associated with those smaller intervals. That's what this operator is doing. It's taking the Haar expansion of F and it's shifting it. It's shifting it down to some smaller intervals with some coefficients. That's why it's called a shift operator. Are there any questions about the shift? Of course, because it's truncated, it's only doing this for intervals i in dmn, intervals i with between scale m and n. Any other interval just gets wiped out. All the other Haar coefficients don't matter. These operators look pretty contrived but they turn out to essentially be truncated Hilbert transforms when you make the right choice of K. Actually, the, the K that I gave above will give you truncated Hilbert transforms. It's a bit of magic, really. So the main result for truncated shift operators, you can probably guess what the result would be. They're bounded when X is UMD, of course they are. X is UMD, P is between one and infinity D. It's a generalized dyadic system. I probably should have an abbreviation for generalized dyadic system since I'm writing it so much. K is an admissible base function. I have an acronym for that. Then for all M less than or equal to N, both of these are integers. We have boundedness of the truncated shift operator on LP with a constant that depends only on P and X. This constant here is independent of M and N. That's the important thing. So if it's gonna be bounded by the LP norm of F, but we can actually say a little bit more than that and we're gonna need that. Firstly, it's bounded by a Rada marker average over all intervals between scale M and scale N, where you can take either, well, we're just gonna take a Rada marker average indexed by the, by the lengths, but of course you could take it indexed by the intervals just as before. Then you take this sort of higher expansion, this, this definition of the truncated shift operator, but you can take a Rada marker average over the, the thing. And furthermore, that, that average is bounded by the LP norm of F. So not only do we have boundedness of the truncated shift operator, but we actually have this intermediate estimate that the shift operator in LP is actually bounded by a Rademacher average in LP of the shift. And yeah, and that is bounded by the norm of F. And we do use both of these estimates. That's why we need them. That's why we prove them. Let's prove it. How long is this proof? Page and a half. Could take us till a break. So, sorry, the last estimate yep. does not depend on K? These don't depend on K either. Okay. Neither of these depend on K because K is normalized in L infinity and that does all the work for us. Uh, if we didn't assume that K was L infinity normalized, we would have a, a term here L infinity norm of K, but K is normalized. It also, the interesting thing is it doesn't depend on that length that's, that, that determines K. So remember K is given as a linear combination of half functions of some fixed length. The estimate doesn't depend on that length. There's some shift invariance as well here. As long as you have the L infinity normalization, it's all good. It'll, it'll be very clear in the proof why that is too. Yeah, this is very transparent. That all good? Yep, thanks. All right, let's prove it. Let's start by just writing things out. So for every interval in this generalized dyadic system, we can write this K sub I, this base function translated dilated to I as a sum over some finite indexing set, which we just call theta. Finite index set, doesn't matter what it is. 
this is just taking what k is as a finite linear combination of half functions. You've got some coefficients. These are in the scalar field. And you have half functions for some i theta contained in i, such that the length of i theta is two to the minus, what letter do I want to use for length? Two to the minus L length of I for a fixed natural number L. So this is what you get by taking the definition of the admissible base function as a linear combination of half functions that are contained in the unit interval and translating that over to the interval I. Everything is translation and dilation invariant here. So that representation will work for every interval basically. Um, what do we need to do from there? Now let's write out the shift operator. Let's just take F in LP and write out what this shift operator is doing to F. I won't bother writing the T and the omega here because we only have one fixed generalized dyadic system in this proof. It'll be a sum over theta and a sum over the intervals I between scale M and N of alpha theta h i theta tensor with the high coefficients on h i, high coefficients on i. So this is done by taking the definition of the shift operator, noting that, okay, you have k sub i for every i, then write out this representation of k sub i. And you see that this sum here doesn't depend on i. That's a useful thing. So let's, what do we need to actually estimate here? We need to estimate the LP norm of this. Maybe I should have just copied and pasted it. Too late for that. So what we'd like to do is use these estimates for Haar expansions that we proved on Tuesday, where we can bound a Haar expansion by this Rada micro average of the Haar expansion, this result I said before. Problem is that this HI and this HI theta, these are they're both half functions, but they're on different intervals potentially, they're pretty much always on different intervals. But the thing is, this function here, this is actually a Haar expansion of the function G, such that the Haar coefficient of G on I theta is the Haar coefficient of F on I times alpha sub theta. It's not the Haar expansion of the function you're thinking of, but it is a Haar expansion of some other function. Uh, just to make sure that you have no overlaps, let me just say G H sub J is zero if J is not equal to I sub theta for some I and some theta. And for this definition to actually make sense, you can ask yourself, okay, what if, what if, I, what if there's collisions within the intervals i sub theta? What if you have i and i prime and theta and theta prime such that i sub theta is i prime sub theta prime? This actually doesn't happen, it turns out. There are no collisions. The way this is defined is that all of the i sub thetas are subintervals of i and the scales are fixed and everything. All of this makes sure that you have no collisions. So how do I want to say this? Uh, I sub theta equals I prime sub theta prime implies I theta equals I prime theta prime. So this whole thing is well defined. And what that lets you do is it says, okay, this thing's a higher expansion of that function. So I use the result from before and I bound that by a rata micro average. And this is what you get in the end. You get the Rada micro variables, you can index them by the intervals or their lengths, it doesn't matter. Of the function that you started with, like that. Does that make sense to people? This is the key conceptual step here. Once you see it in the right way, it's like, oh yeah, this is obvious. But before you've seen it in the right way, you're like, hang on, why can I do this? Right. Anyone have any issues with that? Okay, cool. So what we're nearly there at this point. Now we just say, okay, well, this Rada marker average, it's let's just re-index a little bit. Let's take this as the Rada marker variable 
epsilon two to the minus L length of I, because that's what the length of I theta is. Keep everything else as before. And then you can reparameterize the Rademacher variables again, or take a, a different Rademacher sequence. We're, what we're doing here is we're using the independence of the choice of Rademacher sequence for Rademacher average. And let's replace that with Rademacher averages indexed by the lengths of i. And write everything else as before. This is because the the set of lengths of i is in projective correspondence with the set of lengths of i times 2 to the l, 2 to the minus l. l is fixed. So this is just a bijection between Rademacher sequences. And this, when you combine all of these things together, this is just the operator you started with. You've got k, k sub i instead of this sum over theta. k sub i times the high coefficients. So that's the first estimate we needed to prove. The LP norm of this shift operator is bounded by a Rademacher average over the shift. And whatever over the shift means, you, yeah. It's a bit hard to say exactly what this is in words, but at least in, in math, you can see what it is. We have one more estimate. We need to bound that by the norm of F. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that K is normalized in L infinity. Here's where the L infinity normalization comes up. Since K is normalized in L infinity and K is supported on the unit interval, we have that K of X in absolute value is actually bounded by the half function H of X, the half function on the unit interval for all X. And because of the way we defined these translations and dilations, k sub i is less than or equal to h sub i for all x in r. One of the important things here is that whenever the half function vanishes, so does k. k is not going to be non-zero while the half function is zero. So this inequality makes sense and it's true. k sub i bounded by h sub i. So we take the Rademacher average that we need to estimate. K sub i f h i. What we want to do is we want to replace this k sub i with an h sub i and then use the estimate that I mentioned at the start of the lecture, the Burkholder type estimate that lets you bound that by the norm of f. So how do you get, how do you turn a k sub i into a h sub i? You divide k sub i by h sub i and then you multiply that by h sub i. This is a standard trick. Multiply and divide by one, or so multiply by one. So we want to have h of i here, so we have to compensate like that. This is just multiplication of functions. This is certainly true. You interpret this as being equal to zero when h sub i is zero. <laughs> Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. You end up dividing by zero sometimes, but you don't have to worry about that. If you use the Kahan Kinchin and Fabini standard argument that we've done all the time, this is an integral over R of a Rademacher average. Let's write it all out explicitly and maybe a bit more neatly than that. Okay, there's a constant depending on P here, but that doesn't matter. <coughs> now, if we look on the inside here at this Rademacher average, we have a Rademacher average and we have some coefficients here such that the absolute value of this thing is less than or equal to one. And we would like to get rid of this thing. And we have the contraction principle that lets us do exactly that. So by the contraction principle, this Rademacher average with coefficients bounded by one is bounded by the Rademacher average without the coefficients. We do that for every X. So contraction principle for all X. Okay. 
So we forget about that term that's bounded by one and we leave everything else in there. And we're basically done at this point. We use Gahan Kinchin again and Fabini and we get Radamaka average of, of this guy, H sub I tensor F H sub I. So now we have this Radamaka average over the higher expansion of F, no K involved anymore, K is gone. And this is bounded because X is UMD by the LP norm of F. And that's it. So you can see that the estimate here doesn't depend on K using because K is bounded in L infinity as if it's L infinity norm is bounded by one, L infinity normalized. And because the lengths of these intervals we're dealing with is two to the minus L, yeah, because K is given by this linear combination of half functions at scale two to the minus L or scale L, however you wanna call that, the estimate doesn't depend on L either. So it's, it's nice, everything just works out nicely here. That's the estimate. Okay, I thought that would take us to the break somehow. I completely misjudged time. We still have time, that's good. Any questions? No. Okay. So let's just have a look at the statement of the theorem, just to remind ourselves what's going on. These generalized shift operators, maybe I should have the definition up. These guys, these are bounded uniformly in everything for UMD spaces. But that's not the Hilbert transform yet. That's not even the truncated Hilbert transform yet. The problem is that these operators that we defined, they're defined with respect to a single generalized dyadic system. And so they're not translation invariant and they're not dilation invariant. If you take one of these operators and you translate it a little bit, you'll get another one of the operators with a different dyadic system. This is the whole point of these generalized dyadic systems. They're not translation invariant, but if you take one and you translate it, you get a different dyadic system. So the operators aren't translation invariant yet, but the set of operators is translation invariant. One of the operators is mapped to another one of the operators under translations, also dilations. I keep forgetting to mention dilations. We need that invariance as well. So the way that we make translation and dilation invariant operators out of these things is by averaging over them. <laughs> That's the, the key idea here. We can make a little definition. Let's take X to be UMD, P to be between one and infinity, just to make sure all of our operators are nicely defined and uniformly bounded. K is an admissible base function. Uh, we don't take a dyadic system here because what we're going to do is average over all the dyadic systems in this definition. We do need a probability measure new. Let's take a probability measure on the interval from one to two. You might think the Lebesgue measure is the one to take here. It turns out it's not. Just take an arbitrary probability measure and we'll make particular choices later on. We also take M and N integers. M is less than or equal to N. We will define an operator called the average truncated shift operator. It has a funny notation, S, K, M, N with angle brackets to the power nu. It's not a power, just we need to index that nu somewhere. This will be a bounded linear operator on LP valued in X. And we define it like this. So given an F in LP, uh, we're not gonna define it point-wise, although we could that would work. We just have to make sure the pointwise definition made sense. We're going to define it as a Bochner integral in LP. It's not the only way to do it. Integrate over all of the probability spaces that are involved. Take the shift, the dyadic shift operator applied to F associated with the dyadic system with parameters omega and T and then average in omega and T. Right. We know that this is in LP valued in X. We actually know that all of these operators in here 
are bounded uniformly in M and N, although that doesn't really matter in this definition. So you're mapping LP functions to LP functions. So this is an LP. And we know that that bound is uniform in omega NT. So we know that this LP valued function is actually bounded in omega NT. So we can take a Bochner integral over a probability space and get a nicely well-defined thing. This is Bochner integrable. I haven't said that it's measurable. <laughs> it is measurable. Um, the proof's in the notes, but I'm not gonna prove that here. Let me just note this Bochner integral is well-defined. See the notes. The proof's not too hard. It's, it's a nice proof. I just didn't want to waste too much time doing a well-definedness proof now because well-definedness proofs are, are not fun, really. <laughs> it's well-defined, it's all good. And this operator that we define is actually bounded. And I'll just write down the bounds that we've got. If we want to bound this in LP, we have the LP norm of a Bochner integral and we know from chapter one that LP that norms of Bochner integrals are controlled by Bochner integrals of norms. So we can put the norm on the inside, just average from one to two over all of the tra translation parameters. And we just have the norm of this dyadic shifted function integrated in omega integrated in T. And these things are uniformly bounded, as I said before. So we have a constant that only depends on P and X. Of course, I'm assuming that X is UMD and P is between one and infinity. This is bounded by the LP norm of F independently in omega and T. I then, of course, average that in omega and T and that drops out completely. So we get nice uniformly bounded operators, uniformly bounded in M and N, of course. And uh, I'm not explicitly proving it, but we have all the ingredients to show that this operator we've defined is actually translation invariant because the probability measure on omega actually has this nice translation invariance property that I didn't explicitly say, but it is there. The way we constructed dyadic systems makes that a translation invariant probability measure. This is what Christoph was discussing on Tuesday, if you were there, how we, we want a sort of translation invariant measure, a translation invariant probability measure on the real line that doesn't exist. But if you expand the real line and view it as this infinite product of zero, one to the Z, look at all the formal binary expansions, that has a translation invariant probability measure. The real line's got measure zero in that, but you take this big extension, it's like a compactification, as you said, you can get a translation invariant probability measure. It's a bit weird, but it works. Can I do this last proposition before the break? No, I definitely cannot. So let's do the break now. Are there any questions?